Module 2, Clinical Features, Prevention, and Management of TTN. There are two learning objectives for this module. The first is to review the clinical features of TTN, which will include physical exam features, laboratory testing, and imaging findings associated with TTN. Second, we will describe prevention strategies and management options for infants with clinical signs and symptoms of TTN. Let's revisit the case of the term infant at one hour of life with tachypnea and mild desaturations in room air. Many entities in the immediate newborn period can present with respiratory distress and desaturation, such as TTN, respiratory distress syndrome, infection, pneumothorax, congenital heart disease, and airway and other congenital anomalies, such as congenital diaphragmatic hernia, congenital pulmonary airway malformation, and a tracheal esophageal fistula. The most common cause of respiratory distress in the term infant is TTN. TTN often presents with an infant who is mildly tachypnic with or without other signs of respiratory distress, such as subcostal retractions, grunting, and desaturation. The physical exam findings associated with TTN are not diagnostic. They include common findings such as tachypnea, grunting, hypoxemia, and retractions. These physical exam findings could be seen in any infant with respiratory distress secondary to numerous diagnoses. This makes the diagnosis of TTN challenging. Thus, it is often a diagnosis of exclusion. Because TTN is a diagnosis of exclusion, you must first rule out other, more concerning causes of respiratory distress. Laboratory testing might be helpful in ruling in or ruling out diagnoses such as sepsis, congenital pneumonia, and congenital heart disease. Each individual institution may differ in what laboratory testing they choose to order because there are no specific laboratory findings in infants with TTN. A chest x-ray is a useful tool to rule in or rule out TTN. There are distinct findings on chest x-ray that indicate TTN versus respiratory distress syndrome, meconium aspiration, sepsis, pneumonia, or pneumothorax. The x-ray to the far left demonstrates the classic findings in TTN. Indicated by the red error, you see fluid in the major, major fissure and normal to slightly hyperinflated lungs. There can also be prominent perihilar vascular markings in some patients. The center chest x-ray demonstrates air bronchograms, hypoinflation, and a homogeneous ground glass appearance to the lung fields, most consistent with respiratory distress syndrome. The chest x-ray on the far right shows heterogeneous lung disease with areas of atelectasis and hyperinflation, most consistent with meconium aspiration syndrome. The best approach to preventing TTN is to reduce the incidence of cesarean section, which contributes significantly to the respiratory morbidity in term newborns. Although mortality from TTN is not a concern, it is a very common and frustrating condition that sometimes requires transfer of the baby to the neonatal ICU. Separation from the mother, multiple diagnostic studies, delay in discharge, prolonged hospitalization, and increased healthcare costs. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends scheduling elective cesarean sections at 39 weeks gestation or later, as it is well known that infants delivered electively via C-section prior to 40 weeks gestation without preceding labor are at increased risk for TTN. In fact, studies have shown that for every week less than 41 weeks that an infant delivers, there is a stepwise increased risk for TTN. Thus, elective cesarean section should be scheduled when an infant is at term, and certainly cesarean sections prior to 39 weeks should be avoided unless there is concern for fetal well-being. A recent systematic review and meta-analysis published in BMJ in 2016 concluded that a single course of corticosteroids should be considered for women undergoing planned cesarean section at 37 or more weeks gestation, as well as women at risk for imminent late preterm delivery at 34 to 36 and 6 7 weeks gestation to reduce the risk of respiratory distress. Further studies are required on the optimal dose to delivery interval, optimal corticosteroid to use, effects in multiple pregnancies, long-term effects into adulthood, 
as well as in groups not well studied, including women with pregestational diabetes and those who previously had received a course of corticosteroids. Therefore, steroid administration for women greater than or equal to 37 weeks undergoing elective cesarean section is not standard of care at this time. Treatment for infants with TTN consists primarily of supportive care with or without oxygen as needed to maintain saturations greater than 94%. If respiratory distress is significant, the infant may require CPAP for further support. Because TTN is a diagnosis of exclusion, it is important to maintain suspicion for other pathology by checking on the infant frequently and watching to see if clinical sy symptoms evolve over time. The nonspecific findings and broad differential diagnosis of TTN may warrant other evaluations and treatments while ruling out more concerning diagnoses. Thus, some may choose to obtain a chest x-ray or start antibiotics while awaiting a negative blood culture. This concludes Module 2. Thank you for your attention. We would like to acknowledge the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Organization of Neonatology Training Program Directors, Neo Reviews, and Abbott Nutrition for their support of this educational program. This concludes this module.